we're now discussing new forms of spatial data. And this nicely contrasts with what we've just seen um, about traditional sources of data. New forms of data, or new forms of spatial data, as we will be discussing more in particular, originate within this data revolution that we frame this course against. So they're in a way a product of the availability of cheap technology that generates data um, in addition to storing it and processing. So let's talk a little bit more about what are these forms, how we can characterize them, and also how, what are some of their main promises and challenges. Let's go get a look at them. Okay, so the first thing is what I just said. These are forms of data or sources of data that are very much tied into the geodata revolution that we've been discussing within this course and, and which really frames the nature of, of this course. And these are appearing for researchers in two very uh, punctuated, punctuated uh, forms. The first one is this idea that they're accidental, that if you remember when we were discussing traditional sources, we said these are data that are particularly designed for whatever research purpose um, you have at hand. That is completely out the window when we talk about many of the new forms of data that we'll be working with. They're accidental in the sense that they were created for something else, but almost as an accident, they become available for researchers. And they're very powerful, but it's very important to keep in mind that they were, in many cases, never intended to fulfill this purpose of research. The second idea that I really want to hammer home in this video is that when we talk about new forms of data, we're really talking about many, many different types of data that in many ways they're, they have very little to do with each other. So they may be different in nature. Some of them may be structured as in um, uh, GPS traces, for example, from a smartphone. Some of them might be unstructured as images or sounds or text. They're very different also in terms of resolution some of them are going to come extremely uh, high definition, so very granular. Others will be more aggregated. Some of them will be very aggregated in terms of time, but very granular in terms of space. Some of them will be uh, the other way around. We'll have very uh, high frequency data, but then much coarser spatial resolutions. And most importantly, they're very diverse in terms of quality. Some of these sources are very reliable and unbiased, and others come with very unique biases. So the quality check that traditional social scientists are used to, that were traditionally offload to agencies like the Census Bureau or the Office of National Statistics, that is not there. That check is not there, and that means that the researcher needs to be much more aware and pay much more attention into what are the... Um, into what you could call the quality control aspects of, of using data. And the key and one of the reasons why this is very promising or new forms of data are very promising for a lot of types of uh, research is that in many cases and in, ma in many contexts, they are much more detailed than what we're used to. And we'll see some examples and we're going to work with quite a few of these sources of data throughout the course and you'll see that compared to the traditional equivalent, they are uh, not without problems, but they are a lot more, more detailed. Now, besides being accidental in the sense that I've just discussed it and very diverse in nature, that's pretty much everything that most of these sources share with each other, which means that it makes it quite a challenge to um, categorize this data set. So because of that, academics have thought a little bit about and there's, there's been several proposals. I'm going to talk a little bit about two of them and they are based on data on, on two papers that you can find uh, referenced in the course website. So let's have a look at the first one. The first one comes from a relatively recent paper in 2017, David Laser and, and Radford. And they're talking about new forms of data in the context of sociology. But a lot of what they say really applies to most of to most social sciences. And they categorize new 
data sets or new or big data as they call it, new forms of big data along three main uh, types. The first one is this idea of um, digital life. So this is data that records things and activities that we do in digital spaces. Okay, so activities that couldn't happen without Twitter, without Facebook, without Wikipedia, because they're basically recording our life as we go about and as we live and coexist in these new virtual spaces. So that's number one, digital life. The second one is what they call digital traces. So these are records of digital actions, but not the actions themselves. So for example, CDRs is the record that uh, your telecom keeps when you make a call to somebody. So the call itself is not, um, is not the data. What's the data is the record that says that you held a digital action, in this case, a, a phone call or um, a Zoom call or a video call. Okay, this is, you might have seen the, ref, this referred to in uh, more general literature as metadata. And this became very popular, well, the term became, became very popular with the Snowden revelations about the, the work of the NSA in the, in the US and the massive surveillance programs. Because one of the big uh, controversies and one of the reasons the NSA tried to reason with the public was that the NSA said they're not keeping the calls that you make with other people. They're only keeping the records of those calls. In other words, the metadata. So in their, way, in their view, that is not surveillance, but that's up for debate and, and definitely beyond the scope of this video. But this would fall definitely within the digital traces term of Laser and Radford. And then the final one is what they called um, digitalized life so this is activities that happen in real in phys in the physical world everything is real i mean what we do in twitter and facebook is just as real in some cases more than what we do in the physical world but digitalized life refers to data that records digitally activities that happen in the physical space okay so for example many government records um are are part of this digitalized life for example when you pay taxes, paying taxes is not necessarily a digital activity, but the record that uh, says that you did pay taxes this year is a digital uh, record. So this would be an example of digitalized life. Okay, so based on Laser and Radford 2017, we have three types of uh, new forms of data. Those that record digital life, those that record digital traces, and those that digitalized um, non-digital life, so digitalized life. The second way of looking at new forms of data, much more in the context of spatial data or geographic data, and in particular to urban, but a lot of that also again applies in, in broader context, comes from a paper that I wrote a few years ago, where I looked at the at three levels in which these data are originated. And in some ways it has to do with the technology that generates the data or that helps generate and collect the data. And in some ways it has to do with who is the entity or the agent that is recording this data. So in this framework, we're talking about, again, three types of data, what I call from the bottom up. So these are um, data sets that are recorded through individual sensors that, or through sensors that individuals are carrying around in their everyday life. So for example, you probably uh, have a smartphone in your pocket or right next to, to you on your desk. And that machine, that computer, is constantly recording information about you. It's probably recording where you are. It definitely records who you talk to. It records what pictures you, you take, etc. Every person who owns a smartphone is collecting data in a decentralized form, in an individualized way, uh, in this, uh, with, through this technology. And then this is what I'm calling bottom-up. The second one is what I call the intermediate um, types of sources. And this has to do with businesses whose main activities are either being translated into a digital world or they're what I call or what other people also call digital natives. That is to say that their core activity 
is uh, based on, on a digital space like Facebook or Twitter, like we were talking before. So in this context, what you can think of is records that are generated from companies as a result of, the, of their everyday activities. For example, a store might be selling um, goods and every time there's a, a sale, they make a record. That record in the old days before uh, digital digitalization uh, it might happen on a piece of paper and then that would go on an accountability um, accounting book. But these days is most likely taking place digitally and that means that it's recorded in a database and it's saved in a digital format. And the point of all of this is that because it's being saved in a digital format, in some cases in a structured form even, so as a table, we can then use the power of computers to process and analyze and extract insights from this data that that used to be in, in analog form. An example I've already given uh, it of a digital native is, for example, uh, Google, whose core business activity relies entirely on the digital world. So it's not that translation into digital form of something that happens in the real world is, um, for example, online searches. There isn't a clear a uh, counterpart in the traditional world. So it's, it's a native digital. And in any case, these types of sources, intermediate sources, are generated um, by businesses that as they go on their everyday activities and their core business activities, they're generating data sets. And these data sets, this is the important part for the accidental context I was talking about before, these data sets or part of these data sets are available or end up being available to researchers like social scientists like us and you uh, who are interested in phenomena about society. And then the final one is what I call top-down, which is uh, or relates to data sets collected, generated and collected by government, governmental organizations at different levels from very local to supranational levels. But this is a very top-down approach that contrasts in many cases with the bottom-up that we were discussing before. And in this top-down context, there's uh, an important aspect to mention about the open data movement that in the last few years has been um, generating a lot of, well, not generating, but making a lot of existing data available to the public. So, now that we know at least a couple of ways of uh, categorizing new forms of data, let's talk about some of the main opportunities and maybe advantages, but particularly opportunities. And then we'll move on to some of the challenges that these data are creating, creating com particularly in, as compared to traditional sources. And the opportunities aspect comes again from the Laser and Radford paper. So I should say also this is a very uh, accessible paper. So if you're interested in these, even just as a curiosity, is a very, very readable paper that provides a, a good conceptualization in, in a way that when you read it seems obvious, but it's very, very far from it. And that to me is just a sign that the authors have done a really good job at thinking through what are the main aspects of, of this data that really define them and then putting them down in, in simple categories that everyone can understand. So very recommended reading. So taken from Laser and Radford 2017, we have uh, five types of, uh, or five main opportunities. The first one is what they call, uh, what they term as massive passive. And this refers to the fact that on the one hand, these are massive data sets so it isn't bespoke, small, small batch type of data sets. They are really large databases that collect a lot of information about, um, about whatever they're recording. And the important bit here, the passive, is that they're being collected anyway for other purposes. So this is almost like, in at their best, this is like the best of both worlds, where they're massive enterprises like a census, but for a researcher, they're not as expensive because they're being collected already anyway for other purposes. So a good example is Twitter. Collecting all of the tweets that are constantly being sent and georeferenced is a massive enterprise. But Twitter is already doing it as a result of their main activity because it's their main business um, um, business advantage. 
they're, they're, they make money out of collecting tweets and monet, monetizing them, making money out of them, right? But as a result, as an accident, this massive data set that is passively collected for the purposes of uh, Twitter's business is also being available to uh, researchers. So this is what uh, they refer to as massive and passive. The second one is that many of these data sets open the door to what they call, uh, or what's been termed now casting, this idea of estimating uh, or measuring a system almost or in real time. This is the idea that rather than forecasting a system, you're recording it as it happens. And this is a term that was originally created actually in meteorology. So uh, the the field of meteorology may, makes its, its business really, or it's based on the idea that we can create estimates at, at its best forecast, but if not at least estimates of the weather that is happening either now or in the next few hours or, or few days. And this is only useful if you can get to these estimates before they pass, right? Before they're they're past rather than present or or future. So this term is recently morphed into the social sciences because again, we're starting to be able to now cast different aspects of society. We're starting to be able to now cast prices, for example. Price indices, it was something that used to take several months until the Office of Statistics uh, that produces them were able to release the price index at a given point in time. And through a lot of these new forms of data, like online searches and um, e-retail, etc., cetera, for, uh, we're able to create estimates of what the price index of a set of goods is at a given point, not it was six months ago or nine months ago or a year ago, right? So now casting is a, is, it's an opportunity and, a, and a, a benefit that really opens a lot of doors for understanding systems, but also for managing them because they enable on the fly decisions or, or not on the fly decisions, but they enable decisions being based on information that's much more recent. The third option, the third opportunity is what they call data on social systems. And this relates in, in some ways to the first one, uh, to the massive aspect of the first uh, bullet point here. And it has to do with the idea that a lot of these data sets are collecting holistic systems. So they're not looking at a section or a segment or of a population or a particular group within a bigger system. In many cases, they're collecting the entirety of the population. For example, Twitter data or Facebook data doesn't collect a fraction of the Facebook users, right, of the Facebook population. So if you're interested in uh, online behavior in social networks, Facebook data gives you a, an, a data set of the entire system, not a subset. And this has a lot of implications in many cases beneficial for how we do inference, how we do uh, statistics on the data that we collect from these systems. The fourth one, another one that's really exciting to me, is this idea of natural and field experiments, which, which really relates to um, this always-on um, observatory feature that I have here. The idea is that because these data sets are being collected within so the so technical systems that are constantly on, that they're constantly collecting data in a passive way, and ma massive and passive way, they're creating these, what I always call always on observatories, this idea that the data is being recorded at any given time and gives you a complete movie. So if you think of a census, it's almost like you get a snapshot, you get a picture every 10 years of what's going on in society. But whatever process takes place in between those 10 years and in between two snapshots is completely missed by the data. Yeah. In this context, however, the data is constantly being collected. So rather than collecting snapshots or pictures, what we're collecting is the entire movie. And this enables a lot more opportunities and a lot more um it opens a lot more doors into different types of analysis and different types of understandings. One of the ones that uh, Laser and Rat for focus the most is the idea of natural and field experiments. And it's this idea that the world is constantly 
um, changing in ways that are sometimes unexpected. And these changes allow us to see how human uh, populations react to shocks, to external shocks that we wouldn't expect. So in the old world, we would need to know that one of these shocks, one of these changes is going to happen to be able to record some data before, then record some data after, and then look at the changes. And this is, by definition, almost never possible. Now, in the context of new forms of data, because the data is always on, the data collection is always on, we can, when something happens, we can roll, it's almost like we can rewind the movie, see where the world was before, then let the the movie unfold, see what the world looks like afterwards, and ex establish and extrapolate our own inferences about how certain changes affect populations. And this, uh, for many social scientists who care about something called causal inference, is a huge, huge difference. So this is why sociologists, for there's an aspect of sociology is very interested in this, and this is why uh, it's it's so prominently featured in the in the paper. And the the final one is what they call making big data small. The idea is that these data collection systems are recording enormous population, in some cases, entire populations. And this is good to establish uh, or to learn about general trends of the population, but this is also really good and a fantastic opportunity to learn about really small groups that, because they're so small and so niche, usually they would not be featured in larger data sets, or it would be really hard to find information or, or reliable information about these unique groups in um, in traditional data sets. So ethnic minorities or specific groups that wouldn't be featured because they're part of the population that's being recorded and because these data sets are in many cases individual, they are still being recorded. And even though they're small groups, because the uh, data collection system records the entire population, you can still make very uh, substantial inference. And this is, again, very, very promising in terms of enabling us to learn about segments of the population that were almost, that traditional data sets were blind to. Okay, so five types of uh, key opportunities. And now let's switch on to uh, the main uh, challenges. And this is, uh, this comes from the Rivers Bell 2014 paper on accidental data. And it, it's it's only three. One of them is the idea of um, bias. This is in, in many ways the elephant in the room that we haven't talked about before, but it's important to, to mention the first and, and relates to the fact that if you're interested in the Facebook universe, Facebook data is a very good data set. But if you're interested in the entire uh, society of a country or an entire country, Facebook data only gives you a, a, a slice of it. In particular, the slice that has a Facebook account. And this is not necessarily a random sample. It's definitely not exhaustive. Not everyone has a, a Facebook account. And because of these two th um, characteristics that it, it's a non-random sample, it was a non-random and it's a sample, it means that it can inject biases. And in some cases, these biases can be very, very serious. So this doesn't mean that the data is not useful. Again, if you're interested in online behavior on social networks, Facebook is really good. If you're, in, It means that if you're interested in, uh, well, it, it really goes back to how I started this lecture, this idea that the data sets are accidental and because there's no quality control for research purposes, you need to be the, the quality control officer. You need to think about where is this data coming from? How is this, this data generated? And how can I make sure that it's useful for the purpose that I want to use it? Okay. And bias is, is one of the main challenges and the main hurdles you have to overcome to make uh, successful use of, of new forms of data. The second one is this idea of technical bar barriers, which is which hits very close to home in this course. And it has to do with the fact that a lot of these data sets, they are available to researchers, but they're not necessarily available in, in traditional ways. So while to access the, the data from the census, for example, 
All you need to do is go to the Office of National Statistics website, find its page, and then click on the file that will download the table that you want. I'm overly simplifying the process, but basically there is a data set that's prepared for you to use and that it's made available in a, in a way that it's in many ways tailored to how researchers work. With new forms of data, this is not necessarily the case. And in some cases, the, the vehicles through which these data are made available are different and more technically challenging. For example, a lot of these data sets might require you to scrape a website, or it might require you to talk to what is called an application programming interface, an API, from with which you have to interact through a computer code. Or in some cases, the data are so large that just dealing with them requires technical capabilities that uh, you need to be aware of. And this, I was saying that this hits very close home to this course in the sense that a lot of the features that I've built into the course are designed to help you overcome some of these technical barriers. The idea that you will be programming in a computer language, um, the idea that you will be experimenting with different types of data is very much so you can learn and pick up the skills that you require to make um, the most of the 21st century data sets. And then the final one is related to the previous one, but it's a little bit more uh, conceptual and more subtle. And it's this idea, this idea of the methodological mismatch, the idea that a lot of the techniques and statistics and methods that traditional social science and traditional research relies on were built for a world with very different data, were built for a world that looked much more like the traditional data sets we've seen before. And to the extent that a lot of these new forms of data are not more of the same, they're completely different animals, if you want to look at it that way, um, the traditional methods are not necessarily the most uh, fit for purpose. And to overcome these, we either need to branch out into other fields of expertise that have been working with data that are more similar to uh, the features or, and the characteristics of new forms of data, or we have to invent our, our, our own new ones. And again, this is something that is very much built into this course in the sense that many of the techniques that we're going to see, they originated in fields like computer science, software engineering, information visualization, cartography, etc. And that is uh, something that a traditional statistics course wouldn't necessarily feature uh, all the time. But the, the broader picture, the broader challenge here is remembering that, again, you always have to think about, is this method not only able to cope with this data, but is the method able to make the most and allow me to learn the most out of the data that I have? And that is a, a heavily layered question that requires, you know, many... Um, uh, that requires many answers in subsequent um, steps. Okay, so this was a quick overview into new forms of data or new forms of spatial data.